as we're looking at God's word, when have you been the most on fire for Jesus Christ in your life, in your lives? Something to reflect on. And, and if it's not the way you are right now, what's keeping you from being on fire? What kind of rationalizations or reasons or excuses do we make? Because on the one hand, I remember my wife telling me, she was like, you're the most on fire guy that I ever met when I first met you. And I'm like, that was 21, year, almost 21 years ago. So it's like, it's a good thing. But God is going to call us out of being comfortable this morning. And it's good to do that. That's one of my, uh, my oldest son's favorite sayings. We were driving one night, uh, I think taking uh, his buddy home, and uh, he was like, you know, Chuck, or Dad, <laughs> Chuck Dad, <laughs> Southern Dad, Chuck Dad. Um, he was like, you know, I really hate the things that keep me in my comfort zone when it comes to Christ. You know, basically what he's saying is that I want something that's alive. I don't want religion. I don't something where we sit down and after Sunday and say, well, wasn't that proper? All the, all the verses were covered that morning. No, let's go for it. Let's pray this morning before we leave the sanctuary this morning that we are not the same because the time is short. And God had initially called, what, close to 50,000 people to go and rebuild the work in Jerusalem and then they stopped and they got, they got bogged down, they got beat down, but they got comfortable. And uh, I want to present to you a couple of different scenarios about what the blessing is of a healthy church. And when you go into a healthy church, you're going to know that it's healthy because you got some older folks that have walked with the Lord, but you got some young people that are alive. Why is that important? Why is it important to have that kind of a mix? Well, I want to suggest to you that those of us that are older suffer from the SIAB syndrome. I've seen it all before, syndrome, okay? So we've seen it all, right? Because we've walked with the Lord. Well, then you've got the younger people in the Lord, and they come in, and they suffer from a different uh, syndrome. It's uh, what-do-you-think-you're-doing syndrome. <laughs> or you might add a, uh, on God's green earth, what are you doing, depending upon the situation, right? So you've got people that come in, and they're white-hot on fire for Jesus. All they know is their sins are forgiven, they know John 3.16 because they've been to a football game and they've probably heard a few sermons, but they don't know about Calvinism or Arminianism or whatever isms. They just love Jesus Christ. And then you get the old fogies that are like, well, I can't wait till your zeal dies out. What? Stoke the fire. That's what they need in Pennsylvania. That's what we need in St. Joe. That's what we need in Missouri. That's what we need in the United States. And here in the time of Ezra, they had cooled off. And so I have a word for you to morning, this morning. I want you to say with me, zestos. Say it together. Zestos. And it means zeal. Okay, and we'll talk about that later. If I'm not careful my zeal can cool off. If I'm not careful, my zeal can be emotional. If I'm not careful, my zeal can be based upon circumstances or what you do or what you don't do, and that's not godly zeal. Godly zeal is not a feeling. It's not an emotional pick-me-up, okay? It's a presence, a, a waking, living realization that Jesus Christ is inside of me, and I'm not the same. What does 2 Corinthians 5, 17 say? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That lets me know that old and young are meant to intermix. So an older person can guide a younger person and say, look, I've seen some pitfalls. I've been through some church splits. I've been through depression. I've been through anxiety. Here's what you can expect. And that young person can say, get off of your butt and wake up because it's time to get uncomfortable. And I can't say how many times Amber and I, uh, once a month at Living Hope, they have a, a night of worship. And it's incredible. They have all these gifted musicians, but we get to go in there we don't have to worry about the temperature or the electricity or whether child care workers are there. We just go in there, we praise God, and it's great, and we get to leave. <laughs> whether people show up or not show up, we don't have to stress. But the great thing about it is that it is life. And the reason that we even want to do this, and the reason why I illustrate this, is before we get there, you know what we usually say to ourselves? Well, I'm tired and sore. 
this person ticked me off in traffic. Oh, the kids, they're driving me crazy, and the government don't even get me started. And we can talk, we can talk ourselves out of that blessing, but so can you. When God has called you to do something, and that's what we're going to see here in Ezra, God has called these people to action, and when they weren't careful, 15, 16, 17, 18 years passed, and they got comfortable. So we're going to look at how to be uncomfortable in Jesus. Can I get an amen? I see that hand. I see that face. So Zestos, all right? So Ezra chapter 5, this is return to the work of the Lord. The first six chapters of Ezra deal with the leaders. Zerubbabel, who's the other guy? Anybody remember? He was a high priest. Names, his name rhymes with Mashua. Joshua, okay. Seeing who's awake. Okay. Zerubbabel is from the Davidic line. He was the head of the tribe of Judah. He was in later times referred to as the prince of the captivity or the prince. So he preached like it was 1999, okay? His Chaldean name was Shesbazar. So I don't know if his parents liked him or not, but he was the civil leader. Joshua's from Aaron's line, and he's called Joshua, son of Jehozadak in Haggai and Zechariah, which we will be going to. And he's the spiritual leader. So you get a civil leader, you get a spiritual leader. Cyrus, the king of Persia, had sent them. He had given them the permission, the edict, uh, to go and rebuild. And he said that they could go and get the treasures that Nebuchadnezzar had taken and put them in the new temple, although they weren't all in completion. But he had charged those also in Babylon and Persia that decided to stay and not go for the rebuild to support the other people. Well, that's what we get to do. Whenever anybody's going on a mission trip, whether it's Amity or Savannah or Russia or the DR, which I didn't mention, Joe and Laura, uh, have spent a lot of time in that ministry. Um, if we don't go physically, well, we can always go spiritually, right? And we can help bless them, make sure that they have supplies and provisions to go, okay? So Z and Josh came back with 49 some odd thousand people and undertook the rebuilding of the temple at Jerusalem. And as they began to do that, what always happens is there's an attack by the enemy, you know? And we want to be, we don't want to be Eeyore for Christ. How you doing? Trials and tribulations. We don't want to be that way. We want to be realistic. It's not half full. It's not half empty. There's water in the glass, right? Okay. So whenever there's an attempt of God's work, Satan is always going to rear his ugly head. And uh, what ended up happening, we talked about this last week, is the enemy always appears like he's our buddy. He's our pal. He's got good counsel. And we called those the Samaritans last week. And what they did is they had made a hybrid of Judaism and then pagan religions, okay? And the Jews didn't like him. There was the animosity. We talked about that last week. So in the beginning, the Samaritans and the enemies of the work look like they're your buddies, just like the people that knock on your door, okay? Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons. Oh, sure, we're like, we're like Christians. No, they are not. Read Second and Third John. They are not. That's the spirit of Antichrist when you do not believe who Jesus is like the Bible says, okay? So they have watered down uh, their belief so that it looked like whatever was in the world, Okay? And so, Brother Z and Josh, they withstood him, okay? As a result, then these people showed their true colors, not to quote uh, Cindy from the 80s, but uh, they write letters back to Babylon, and they make false accusations. Now, in the, in the New Testament, we read about that because the enemies of Christ, false accusations against Christ. You know, that's going to happen with us in the workplace, in your family. People are going to say things because they're watching you, and when they see the light of Christ, they're usually going to do a couple of things. They're either going to be drawn to it towards repentance, or they're going to come back in the darkness, and they're going to point at you. And they're going to point at you, and they're going to bring about false accusations. And here's why they don't want their deeds to come into the light, right? Light bright? Okay. So they write letters to Babylon, make false accusations until Artaxerxes, the king of Babylon at that time, sent a letter back to stop the work of the Jews completely, and he was effective. And that was between 15 and 18 years. So they should not have allowed the work to stop for that long, but they got distracted. Oh, look at that balloon. 
You come to church, you know, you're in the car, maybe you have an argument with your wife. I think that's why Pastor Pat's pastor drove in separate cars from his wife when they would go to church on Sundays, okay? Because they know it's going to happen, you know? You're, you're sitting there, you're worshiping the Lord, and you're thinking, wow, is Mark wearing socks? <laughs> You weren't thinking about that until now, but it's easy to get distracted in our day and age, okay? So that's what happened to them. It happens to us as well. The work stopped initially because of the threat of violence, but they continued to put off the work because they got too comfortable. They weren't getting stretched. You know, sometimes you hear those groans when older Christians work with younger Christians. Oh, no, they're getting on my nerves. They got that zeal, you know, but it's good. It represents life, okay? So they got too comfortable in the land because they began to prosper in the land, okay? They didn't just simply build houses. Haggai, I believe, talked about how they build paneled houses. If you go to Israel today, one thing is common in the terrain. It is rocky, okay? Very, very rocky. They're very common. There's an old story that says that God sent a couple of angels out to distribute rocks all over the earth. One of them was faithful, the other one was not faithful, and he just dumped all his load of rocks in Israel. And so it's kind of like that. So they got plenty of rocks, not a lot of wood. So when the prophet says, look, you spent all this time building paneled homes, that means they got comfortable, they got indulgent, and they really focused inward. And it was about them. And what Haggai says is, look, here's the temple of God, and it's in ruins, and it's not being rebuilt, okay? So, they had accumulated comfort rather than listening to the call of God upon their lives. Question number one, have you and I chosen comfort over the call of God upon our lives? Something to think about. So they had come into the land with that burning enthusiasm with zestos, as Jesus spoke of it in Revelation 3.15 to the letter of Laodicea, I know your works, you're neither hot nor cold, and I wish you were either hot or cold, but I'm going to spew you out of my mouth because I'm lukewarm. But that word for hot is red hot on fire for Jesus Christ. That is zestos, okay? So they come into the land, they're hot with zeal, and then 15 years later go by, and it's all about comfort. And so the lesson of chapter 5 is return to the work of the Lord. Return to what God has called you to do. There are times when you're like, Lord, I don't know where we're going. I, it seems like we're swimming. I'm in the ocean. I can't see what's going on. And God says, go back and do the first things. Fall back on what you do know when you're in a cir circumstance or situation you don't understand. Okay? In our culture, when we're uncomfortable... We think it's somehow not God's will. Oh, this is hard. God couldn't be in this. No, no, he is. He is in that, okay? And so, um, you know, whether or not it's God's will is not based upon whether or not the work is easy or, or difficult. And here God's prophets bring about the word of the Lord in order to produce the work of the Lord in the lives of his people. Now, here is the order. A lot of churches have this mess, messed up, okay? They come in and are like, you need to do this. All right? You need to do this. But historically in the church, God's word always precedes God's work. Otherwise, we're doing it for the wrong motives. So God's word encourages and calls us, and it's specific. This is about us and God's word, okay? But God's word always precedes his work. We see that in church history. If you look at times where the church was dead and there was no life and it was given over to more like traditions and liturgy, then you had to have somebody like a Huss. You had to somebody like a, like a Whitfield, uh, a Luther. They had to come back in and they brought back the word of God. So you return to the word of God, that's going to precede the work of God. Okay. So, hey, let's just read the word, shall we? Ezra 5. Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah Zechariah, the son of Ido, prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, or that's Joshua, the son of Josadak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, helping them. 
So at this point, after close to 20 years, is where we're at here in chapter 5, when the people were discouraged and defeated, Haggai and Zechariah prophesied to them. Now Haggai begins to prophesy in about August of 520 BC until December, and then Zechariah was in for the longer haul. He starts October, November, and he goes on for over four years. So again, it's through the word of God that the people are being renewed and they're coming back to life. And, and again, the work begins to move forward, which is always God's way. Um, Haggai was intensely practical. And uh, of course, Zechariah was very mystical. Have you read Zechariah? That's a trippy book. That's some good stuff. Though. There's some Star Trek in there, okay? Some good stuff in there. But Haggai chapter 1, the prophet says in verse 4, Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? You have planted much but harvest little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. So he again knows that the word of God is going to produce the work of God. And his prophecy was more of a direct encouragement to get busy in the work of rebuilding the temple. And Zechariah's prophecy was more directed to the spiritual condition of the returned exiles. 1 Corinthians 14 says this is the purpose of prophecy. It's for edification and it's for exhortation and comfort. Okay? So in other words, it's to build up and it's to get moving and it's to bring comfort. All right? Verse 3. At the same time, Tatanai, the, he was a Persian governor of the region beyond the river, and uh, Shether Bosnai, who had interesting parents, their companions came to them and spoke thus to them, Who has commanded you to build this temple and finish this wall? Now, this is actually reads a little bit different in the Hebrew language than the previous chapter. It's not uh, with as much malice. It's more about uh, this person's position making sure that uh, what they're doing is legitimate. So he actually seems more reasonable than the Samaritans who opposed the work some 15 years before this. So not everybody who opposes God's work um, do it out of premeditated evil. Sometimes they're just doing it out of custom and sense of duty. Verse 4, Then accordingly we told them the names of the men who were constructing this building. Then accordingly, we told them, okay, we told them the names of this men. So uh, this was recorded by Ezra to demonstrate, demonstrate that there was no hint of rebellion among the Jews, okay? That they were just following God's uh, plan for their lives as a group, and it was not a coup, all right? So uh, the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews. It's a great, just a great preaching verse so that they could not make them cease till a report could go to Darius, and then a written answer was returned concerning this matter. So the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews. Did anybody here think of the eye of the tiger when they read that? Me neither. Okay. So um, the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews. So there's so much that God does quietly, that he does secretly, while his people are ministering. We don't know. We don't see all that God sees, okay? It's outside of our vision as we ser- serve him. But the key, as his people, is getting us to take that step of faith. You think of that Indiana Jones movie where he can't cross the ravine, and he goes and he takes that step, and all of a sudden that step materializes? I wonder if somebody who was a preacher was involved in that decision for that movie. So it's so that God can show himself strong on our behalf. This is not about any one person. Calvary St. Joe is about the sheep, the people, the the people of his pasture, okay? So it's so important that we focus on the presence of the Lord in the midst of opposition. Now, I can say that, and then I can go home and deal with Satan's dog and think, how do I live that, okay? When the cars break down, when your wife is sick, okay, and we're going to pray for Ann Wood, who's been sick for two weeks here before we end, Okay, when things are down, it's much more difficult. And yet what God is saying is, my eye is on you. I have not left you. I will not forsake you. Even when you're in uncharted territory, my word is greater than your feelings and your fears, okay, and your doubts. 
So it says tiller or port could go to uh, Darius. So this was good for two reasons. Number one, think about the nature of bureaucracy, okay? And the slow postal system, if you think ours is slow, uh, no offense to postal workers, uh, although my dog has caused you a lot of offense. Um, I actually have a nickname for her that they haven't told us what the nicknames are. Yeah, okay. So this is so that the work could continue for some time, but secondly, that they could, in the meantime, pray and trust that God would guide King Darius to a favorable decision. So verse 6, this is a copy of the letter that Tet and I sent. So they said, you know what, we're not going to quit this building project like last time until you go back to Darius and ask him concerning the decree that was made from Cyrus that gave them permission to build the temple. Uh, the governor of the region beyond the river and uh, Shethar Banzai and his companions, the Persians, who were in the region beyond the river to Darius the king, verse 7, they sent a letter to him in which was written thus, to Darius the king, all peace. Let it be known to the king that we went into the province of Judea, to the temple of the great God, which is being built with heavy stones, and timber is being laid in the walls. And this work goes on diligently and prospers in their hands. Now, the heavy stones aspect here that we read about may have aroused suspicion because they could have suspected that they were building up a, a fortress. But actually, at this time, sections of timber uh, between stone and brick were a common construction feature over a long period in the ancient Near East uh, and may have helped to strengthen against earthquakes. Okay. Verse 9, then we asked those elders and spoke thus to them, who commanded you to build this temple and to finish these walls? We also asked them their names to inform you that we might write the names of the men who were chief among them. And thus they returned us an answer saying, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth and we are rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and completed. But because our fathers provoked the God of heaven to wrath, to anger, and he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Chaldean who destroyed this temple and carried the people away to Babylon. However, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Babylon, King Cyrus issued a decree to build this house of God. Also, the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebi had taken from the temple that was in Jerusalem, carried into the temple of Babylon, those King Cyrus took from the temple of Babylon, and they were given to one named Sheshbazzar, whom he had made governor. And he said to them, Take these articles, go, carry them to the temple site that is in Jerusalem, and let the house of God be rebuilt on its former site. And then the same, Sheshbazzar came and laid the foundation of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. But from that time, even until now, it has been under construction and it is not finished. You know what's interesting about this? Is that God is using an unbeliever, King Darius, a pagan king, to accomplish his purposes. Well, heck, didn't that sum up the presidency of the United States? <laughs> I mean, come on. We're looking at this election going, are you kidding me? Well, God can use unbelieving people. Daniel says they're only there because he allows them from his control in his hand, Okay. So that's the content of the letter, and now is his request to the king. Verse 17. Now, therefore, if it seems good to the king, <laughs> and you want to be careful how you speak to a king, let a search be made in the king's treasure house, which is there in Babylon, whether it is so that a decree was issued by Cyrus to build the house of God at Jerusalem, and let the king send us his pleasure concerning this matter. So, you know what I love about this? They didn't make excuses for their sin. They said, you know what? Our fathers sinned, and we brought on God's wrath. They just called it like it was. And we have a thing in our bathroom on the wall that says, you know what? God doesn't cleanse excuses. He cleanses sin. Plus, he already knows, doesn't he? I'm going to hide something from God. Well, God, you don't know about that. Yes, Chuck, I was right there. Yeah, of course he does, okay? So they just told it like it was. They were honest. They said it was our sin. And then the leaders of the region, the enemies of the people of God, called, uh, told Darius to check the records to see if Cyrus had to issue a command. So they're probably thinking that it wasn't true, okay? But he's going to be proven wrong. Ezra 6, we can do this 
because the second temple is completed. Verse 1. Then King Darius issued a decree, and a search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon. And at that place in the palace, that is in the province of Medea, a scroll was found, and in it a record was written, thus they found it. They weren't lying. They told the truth. Where'd they find it? Uh, well, Akmetha, which is probably Ekbatana, <laughs> which just rolls off the tongue, uh, the ancient capital of Media. So, yeah, it was about 265 miles away, okay? If we were only dealing with natural means, they probably would not have found this scroll. But you know what? We've already read that the eyes of God were upon them. And God sees, God knows, God guides and God directs, God provides. So the enemy of our soul, he accuses us, he condemns us in an attempt because he wants to stall what God's called you to do. And he's pretty clever. You know? The thing we, that we've noticed over the years, though, is that he tends to do the same thing over and over. You tend to have to have the same kind of trials and tribulations. So if, if you're not an assertive person, more than likely, you're going to have a lot of type A people in your life, and God's going to teach you how to deal with people that can be aggressive, right? And he will call you to do that because he's trying to do something inside of me and inside of you that's going to produce fruit. And that kind of fruit points people to why this is true. And it's not just another mythological belief, right? It's that fruit. Now, is it perfect all the time? Look around. Are you kidding me? We're all flawed people, okay? But it is worth it. It is worth an eternal soul to do what we're doing. Can I get an amen this morning? Okay. So tucked away in a place called heaven is another scroll, and it's the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay? It would shock the, our enemies to know that our names that have called upon Christ are written on that scroll. Okay, so all the sins that you have ever committed, even though you and I can't forget, that's one thing God willfully forgets is our sins because they're cleansed by the blood of Christ. And he chooses to do that. Now, we're not that way. You know, we get into arguments, we're bringing up the past. Well, I remember when you did that. God says, well, I remember when you did that. Busted. Okay, so the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary is sufficient to cover our sins. If you're not feeling that way this morning, pray about it. Say, you know what, God? I, I know technically, I know the, the word says that I'm forgiven, but I keep feeling condemned. Or I, feel, I keep feeling like I keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. He will meet you there. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So all the while, for believers, our names is preserved, eternally written in indelible ink of the same blood. So verse 3, chapter 6. In the first year of King Cyrus, King Cyrus issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt, the place where they offered sacrifices. Let the foundations of it be firmly laid. And it's going to give uh, descriptions of it, okay? Uh, verse 5, also let the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebi took from the temple, which is in Jerusalem, brought to Babylon, be restored, taken back to the temple, which is in Jerusalem, each to its place, deposit them in the house of God. Now, therefore, Brother T, governor of the region beyond the river, and that guy and your companions, the Persians who were beyond the river, keep yourselves far from there. Stop it. <laughs> Let my people go, okay? Let the work of this house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build the house of God on its site. Moreover, it gets better. Oh, yeah. I issue a decree as to what you shall do for the elders of the Jews for the building of this house of God. Let the cost be paid at the king's expense from taxes on the region beyond the river. Wouldn't that be great if, if that happened with the president of the United States? I'm just daydreaming. Sorry. Okay. This is to be given <laughs> immediately to these men so that they are not hindered. And whatever they need, young bulls, rams, lambs, for the burnt offerings for the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the request of the priests who are in Jerusalem, 
Let it be given them day by day without fail, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet aroma to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. Also, I issue a decree, verse 11, that whoever alters this edict, there's going to be ramifications if they don't uphold the law. Let a timber be pulled from his house and erected and let him be hanged on it. Let his house be made a refuge heap because of this. And may the God who causes his name to dwell there destroy any king or people who put their hand to alter it or to destroy this house of God which is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, issue a decree. Let it be done diligently. Wabam! Wow! Yeah, they've got an unbeliever on their side. But don't miss this. The difficulty raised by their foes really became their benefit. The difficulty raised by their foes really became their benefit. I don't know if I think I read somewhere, New Testament, God works all things together for to those who are Christ, who are the called according to his spirit. So, wait a minute, let me understand this. So I'm going through something and it seems difficult, it seems like hard, and it seems like nobody else is doing something for 15, 16, 17, 18 years. And then God has the ability to bring in prophets and the word of God and continue the work that he's begun. Yes. Yes, he does. He does it today. Do people get saved today believing in and on Jesus Christ? That's because he is the God of yesterday, today, and forever. Boy, we need to know that. We need to know that. So, okay, here's why what the enemy tried to do worked against them. Number one, the, the king decrees that their needs get supplied and their expenses get met, and then the people that hinder their progress, um, he's, he's going to use to help with great gifts. And it reminds me of somebody in the book of Esther. Mordecai. Okay? So, all the attacks then backfired on Haman. Right? So when you obey God, you at once ensure his cooperation for the accomplishment of the task at hand. Here's the thing. You get to know that you're in God's will. You get to have the peace. Not perfection. Not that you're going to be ensconced in people that wake up and sing songs thanking you for providing for their electricity, you know, or greeting you with Altoid breath. It's still going to be real life. But you know that you know that you know that God has got you. Here's the thing. Nobody can take that away from you. So important. There's so many things in this country, in this life, that people have the ability to alter that affect our daily living. They cannot do that about salvation in Christ Jesus, right? So verse 13, Then Tatanai, governor of the region beyond the river, uh, that guy and their companions diligently did according to what King Darius had sent. And so the elders of the Jews built, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Idu. And they built and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel, and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And now the temple was finished on what day? Third day. That's interesting. Of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. So the temple was finished on the third day. What day did Jesus rose? rise? <laughs> the third day. Hosea 6.2. After two days, God will revive us. And in the third day, he will raise us up. You don't have to get yourself emotionally intense. He does the raising. That's good news. Some of us are getting older. Verse 16, then the children of Israel, some of us, then the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites and the rest of the descendants of the captivity celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. Not with Eeyore, with joy. Because they, they, there wasn't going to be one person that could do this. It had to be a group effort. They had to have communication. They had to have a common cause. It had to start with the word of God. Okay? So, there was a previous celebration many years before at the founding in Ezra 3. And this is a celebration for the finishing of a functioning temple. And the word for dedication is Hanukkah, we're familiar with. And it was later to become the name of a festival in memory of the temple's uh, reconsecration, 165 BC. You know how the work began? Was everybody on board? 
No, it was a chick flick, man. Some people cried. Some people were joyful. So they were able, still able to, to get work done. You ever get surprised how, like, in church life, you think, well, man, if just everybody was just on board all the time doing what they're supposed to do, we'd get so much done. No. Sometimes God uses a few people. And while God uses those few people, there are other people that are hurting. And they have real tears. That's why we're here this morning, right? We can hug, we can pray, we can, men, listen. And you know what? Here's the beauty of it. We don't have to give answers. Okay, we just keep it about Jesus, right? Let's point people to Jesus Christ. Okay, so now, while it started with joy and tears, all the people are rejoicing in 616. It's highly probable that this is when Psalm 146 through 148 were composed. In the Septuagint, they're entitled the songs, uh, Psalms of Haggai and Zechariah. Don't you love the joy of worshiping and serving God? Where you just, you just let it all loose? Anybody, was anybody here when Bear Packwood used to come? Remember Bear? Quadriplegic. Pulled him in his wheelchair. He'd be right up there. He would lift up his arms and he would say, Amen. And you knew the price that he paid to lift up his hands because he was so uncomfortable. But he got to worship and he praised the Lord. And it was real. He just gave what he had. And God saw that and he blessed it. So the joy of worshiping and serving God, um, again, is always accomplished or accompanied by Satan's attempts to spoil it. So Satan just doesn't know any better, okay? And it's, it's the heart, it's the passion, it's the core of this very nature, but Satan can't thwart the plans of God. You know, he can only, he can only cause delays. Daniel 4.35 says, All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? Verse 17, Ezra 6. And they offered sacrifices at the dedication of this house of God, 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they assigned the priests to their divisions and the Levites to their divisions over the service of God in Jerusalem, as is written in the book of Moses. So they offered sacrifices. Uh, now, what do you think this is like compared to the dedication of Solomon's temple? A little less intense, right? Solomon's temple, what, what, what did he have? 142,000 animals. That's a lot. <laughs> Probably stinketh is what I'm thinking. <laughs> it's like Lazarus temple, okay. Tasty barbecue, when that got cooking, right? Okay, I don't know if it was Gates barbecue back then. But given the relative wealth of Israel in the days of the first temple compared to the second, this smaller gift recorded in Ezra may have been more sweeter to God. There were lost people, but there were people that were going for it. You know what? All these pews aren't filled here this morning. Aren't you guys going for it? It's all about Jesus Christ, right? What he's done in our lives. If he hadn't impacted our lives, why would we be here? Uh, is it a Chiefs morning? Do the Chiefs do something on Sunday mornings? I don't know. Okay, nobody cares. Okay. <laughs> they already played? Okay. Okay, so you guys do know. You're busted. No, sorry. <laughs> All right. Get, let, just don't take my word for it. Luke 21, 1 through 4. And he looked up, and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, Truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all, for all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. You know, we can be like Bear this morning. You know, we might say, well, God, I just don't have that much. God says, I, I don't care. Give me your heart. And if you don't feel it, give me your heart anyway. And pray, because that is faith, right? As we're wrapping it up, verse 19, the descendants of the captivity kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. 
For the priests and the Levites had purified themselves, and all of them were ritually clean, and they slaughtered the Passover lambs for all the descendants of the captivity, for their brethren the priests and for themselves. And then the children of Israel who had returned from the captivity ate together with all who had separated themselves from the filth of the nations of the land in order to seek the Lord God of Israel. In the last verse, they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord made them joyful. And he turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. So this has been the first Passover since King Josiah's, which was more than 100 years earlier. So 100 years before their last Passover, this had to have been special. It says in verse 20, they were made clean. It says they purified themselves. They were unified. They ate together. Who partook? Well, everybody who had separated themselves from the filth, the uncleanness of the nations of the land. You know what, though? They couldn't do it all alone, and they couldn't do it by themselves. That's what we are here. You know, we're, we're in, in theory and practice, hopefully. Our goal is we want to be cleansed of the stuff that gets on us throughout the week. You know what the biggest enemy is there? It's pride. We're all sinners. We are all flawed. I don't care if you get a pastor, if you have a master's in theology, sinner, <laughs> in practicology is what we all have. And if you will humble yourself this morning and say, God, you know what? This is hard. This is difficult. Lord, I don't know what to do. Man, he will meet you there. And I got to tell you, when he meets you there and he brings up a Bible verse, you own it. It becomes a part of you. Haven't you ever noticed sometimes when somebody's reciting a verse or whatever, we're like helping them along. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We love it. It's a part of us, okay? So the Lord made them joyful. And in the context of obedience and purity, as I invite Mark and uh, Fred up here as we're going to go home with a go-home song, they didn't lose their joy. And the purity of God's delivered people was joyful in its character instead of like Eeyore. But it also lent, led them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God. And F.B. Meyer said, Do not be afraid of joy. When God makes you joyful, don't think it's necessary to restrain your songs or your smiles. And so if you'll agree with me, I want to pray for Anne. And I want to pray for our joy. And I want to pray for God to meet us exactly where we're at this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you are a healer and a physician that can reach out to Ann Wood right now and alleviate her pain. And right now, Father, prayers are going up. And Lord, you know what she needs even before we pray, but you ask us to pray. So God causes us to do it. Whether it's Sunday, Monday, just all throughout the week, just interceding for our sister. Father God, I pray for restored joy. Sometimes it is so easy just to look at work that we kind of have a, uh, it's kind of like a theological eclipse and we don't see you. We don't see the Son of God. Help us, Lord God, to see Jesus Christ, not other people, not the disappointments that have happened in life, but Jesus Christ that looks at us and says, forgiven. And Father God, I pray for the things right now in anybody's heart here this morning that have been immovable. And they are too heavy for you to bear. Lord, we know that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. But the people that have those burdens have to come to you. Lord, I pray that you do that. Lord, help them to walk away from pride and say hello to Jesus Christ this morning. In whose name we pray, amen.